go ahead and do this, and this is 2003. Well, that, of course, grant ran out, and we've had a hard time in the second half of the latest administration, not the new one. Um, all the environmental grants dried up, literally overnight. And uh, so we're, we're, in fact, their laboratories at major universities are closing down now, and that's as well. So, but we just, we found a private donor to do a little bit more. I started to publish this paper and then realized I didn't have enough data to really publish this in a physics journal. Every one of those that are up there are published either in the Acoustical Society of America, um, which is the American Institute of Physics, IEEE, um, European Physics Journals. Um, so I like to do research that's research. And unfortunately, these naturalists that have, will fondly call him sham, although I don't know what it is, these poor people that have spent literally half their lives documenting this creature have been criticized and ridiculed for absolutely no reason. And we'll come to that in a minute. This is a little bit about sound. The three things fundamentally that you have to know about sound. One is the frequency. That's the pitch. It's either high or low. Now, when you talk about frequency, you have something called hertz. That's what it's expressed in. If you can see here, here's the human hearing range. This is the hearing range and communication range, basically, of different animals. We can only hear from about 20. If you've ever been to a rock concert and you're an adult, uh, think about 40 hertz as your, your bottom line. And um, technically 20,000 hertz, which is one hertz is one cycle per second. Five hertz is five cycles per second. So when you're talking about whale, <laughs> that's 100,000 cycles per second. That is echolocation. So anything above here to way beyond is called ultrasound. Anything beneath 20 hertz is called infrasound or below our hearing range. This is called the sonic range based on our hearing. The next thing you have to think about when you talk about sound is the amplitude, which is the loud loudness expressed in decibel levels. This is sort of a, a good average of what dB is. Now, normal conversation, 60. I'm probably talking at about 75 right now. Um, and live rock music, 120, that's what I say. <laughs> an adult and you've been in an ACDC concert, you better bless the fact that you had earplug. Um, 130 dB is the pain threshold. And if you look, underwater is different. If you look at a whale, they can go up to 188 dB, which is above a jet taking off. They're extremely loud, and before we had mechanized shipping, they were capable of uh, communicating across oceans. So that's amplitude, that's loudness. So we have pitch, loudness. And the third one is time. Now in air, all right, the sound travels at 739 miles per hour. When an airplane, an airplane show, you probably heard a sonic boom, they just passed that barrier, that miles per hour. In water, the, the, basically how it is, the denser the substance is, the faster the sound is going to travel. In water, it's 3,313 miles per hour. That's fast. Rock substrate, 10,000 to 13,000 miles per hour. That's fast. And so any communication that's ultrasonic, high frequency, going this fast, or even low frequency going this fast, is one of the best ways to communicate. Now, the one thing, if I reverse myself back to talking about frequency, high frequencies 
such as ultrasound that bats and whales and dolphins use as echolocation, bounces off objects. Our communication can go through a door, but it's not going to go much further than that. I, I know for certain they can't hear me out in the parking lot. Now, a whale, when they communicate infrasonically, you can hear them seven to eight hundred miles away. All right. In the atmospheric uh, recording of stuff, we have the microphones recorder and analysis. Underwater, they're called hydrophones. This is a Navy hydrophone. You want to pass this around? These aren't the ones you can get over the internet. Um, and this is part of what we use. Um, I can't show you the ones that are classified. Um, and they assigned me we have something called geophones, which stick in the ground and measure that, of course not. What is the frequency range, the pitch? What is the distance from the source that's creating it? And what is the ambient noise? In other words, background noise. Like if I were recording in here, I would be picking up people talking outside. So you have to really look at, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of variables. Now the big thing is analysis. We designed this using National Instruments. Um, this is a 50 layered software program that took us a year and a half to design and build. Basically what happens is when we plug in the recorder and hook it up to the microphone, this scrolls across in real time. If I see something interesting, I can take a snapshot of it, then take analysis of it. This is a 2D FFT analysis. It's called Fast Forward Transform. Um, the 2D means short-term fast forward transform. 1D is just an FFT. In this, in this case, this is time, your time domain. So that's point, uh, it's almost a minute. This right here is frequency. 2.00 E plus 4 is 20,000 hertz. So already above our hearing range, basically. And the density is the loudest. So red, the dark red, would be the loudest. And uh, so there it is. Um, I talk a lot about the Sumatran rhinoceros because they're critically endangered. There's less than 200 left in the world. They're in Indonesia, which right now is undergoing violent volcanic and uh, earthquake things. And we've been trying for years to get them recognized. They're, uh, uh, there's one breeding population in the world, and that's at the Cincinnati Zoo. So if you ever get a chance to go up there, make sure you see them. Um, they're, they're absolutely beautiful creatures. And they make uh, certain really cool noises. Um, and I'll let you listen to this. Um, there was a paper at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum of, of a, a gentleman there that uh, he just recently died, but he was director of paleontology. And his theory was that Parasodactyla, or rhinos in this case, horses, originally came from the ocean. And uh, this will be an indication of why he thought that. Example of why uh, people 
for some reason are narcissistic. We can't smell as well as our dog. We can't even see as well as they can. Our cats can't, certainly. They're night, they've got night vision. Dogs do too. But for some reason, we seem to think that we have to base everything on what we can see, hear, and smell, rather than looking at animals as this incredible font of information that we are not privy to. This is a golden lion tamarind. They're critically endangered as well. They stand about this high, and they're really scared of you until they want to play with your hair. And then they eat it, and it's painful. <laughs> I saw the scar right here from one of them grabbing on because they didn't want to let go. Um, this first vocalization that you're going to hear is in real time. In other words, this is what they sound like to us. The second one that you're going to hear is what it actually sounds like to them. They're so high in frequency, in other words, they're ultrasonic, that we can't hear but a very, very minuscule portion of their vocalizations. So here's what they sound like to us. Here's what they sound like to each other. at 120 dB. That's lab. That's rock concert lab. 18 hertz at high decibel level does the following. It vibrates the eye, leading to blurred vision. It can cause your hair to stand on end. It can cause temporary paralysis. And it generates feelings of fear, often expressed as creepy. In fact, what they found is haunted houses actually have a river running by or a uh, and a, a, some sort of road or something like that, or the, the ancient tunnels underneath it with wind blowing through it that vibrate the building, and it turns out it's right at 18 hertz. So possibly you didn't see a ghost, you're just being affected by 18 hertz. <laughs> and uh, tigers are marvelous creatures. I don't know if you read recently in the, in the newspaper, but. Uh, there's several that are that are nearly extinct again. Um, this other one is a cat's purr. Um, this was published in 2006 and um, is a patented device that we designed based on this research. Now, if you were to look at this, I took this to uh, and handed it out at one of the conferences I was at with a bunch of really geeky acousticians like me um, from all over the world. And um, I said, what is this? And they looked at it and they said, oh, it's an engine. I thought, okay, it's an engine. It looks like the timing's a little off, but that's clearly an engine. Uh, <laughs> okay. Right here is 25 hertz. 2.50. This means, this section here, this is the 1D FFT I was talking about. Um, there's no time involved in this. This um, is how loud it is. So this is an important signal right here, and that's what's called the fundamental frequency. Now the fundamental frequency, you double it, that's the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic. Now if you notice, the peaks, the most important portion of the cat's purr, are on certain very specific frequencies. And the interesting thing about this is they all look the same regardless if it's a 170 pound cougar or a 7 pound house cat, which should be technically physically impossible because the, the purr is generated by the vocal cords and, and the diaphragm. Here's a kitty purr. Here's a cougar. Um, despite their size, despite their geological evol evolution, Africa, South America, North America, Asia, 
Um, well, we found that um, these frequencies are all used in healing, vibrational healing in the medical community. Trust me, I spent over 500 hours, or 500 hours, Duke Med Library finding this. Um, Osteo diseases are rarely found in cats, but can be found in all breeds and sizes of dogs. Um, veterinary, 3,000 journals made up a study. It took me two years. Um, the bottom line is if you go online, you can, you, can, you can read about this whole study. Muscles, tendons, and ligaments with regard to, oh, that's all veterinary stuff. We don't need to get the champ. Uh, okay, feelings including cougar, cheetah, cerebral, oscillate, caracal, lion, and the domestic cat hurt. They all hurt the same frequency, plus or minus two hertz. 25 hertz, remember the chart I just showed you, the fundamental frequency, is used in the human medical community for bone growth and fracture healing and osteoporosis. 50 hertz is the same thing, those two highest ones. 100 hertz is used in medical for pain relief, relief of breathlessness, chronic pulmonary disease, tissue and wound repair, and infection. 125 hertz is used in the medical community for muscle, tendon, and ligament repair and counteracting atrophy. So Liz, are you saying that if we put our cat in our lap, it would be more healthy? No, you have to purchase my device when you come out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes, absolutely. In fact, I get at least, I would say, over 100 emails per week of people saying, you know, I have migraines, terrible migraines, and I just adopted a cat. And since the cat has been, will sleep on my head at night and my migraines have gone away. Or I've broken a bone and the cat just wants to sit on that leg or does all these things. And, and I mean, and technically they're healing themselves. So there's no reason. I say, if you want to stay healthy, get a cat. The other thing that you might want to do is when you read on this on the website um, and actually in the published, published paper, the best thing you can do for yourself is to walk barefoot. Your body is perfectly designed so that the vibration that you create by just your footsteps is actually strengthening your bones, is strengthening your tendons, muscles, and every single organ in your body vibrates at a different frequency. But your body is created to heal itself by walking barefoot. Unfortunately, uh, most people wear shoes. I normally don't. The only reason I am is because I'm here. <laughs> I walk around barefoot all the time. And um, I get criticized walking in the stores and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? I'm not going to get osteoporosis. <laughs> all right. Now we're on to what we found in Lake Champlain. Um, this is to be published in the Journal of Acoustical Society of America, American Institute of Physics, and it is the first documented case of echolocation or biosonar found in a freshwater lake. Now, echolocation is a very high frequency used by bats, dolphins, and whales. That's all we know, and two types of birds, cave birds, which is essentially the same thing as bats. Um, it's a high frequency signal, so if I went bing, I would get a three-dimensional picture of that echo stand right there. Not, and, and, and it's an incredibly advanced communication system. There's something in dolphin and whale in the, front of, uh, in the front of their brain called a melon. And what the melon does is send that signal out, gets the signal back quickly, and then processes it as an actual three-dimensional picture. And they can actually use that to give it to somebody else. So, sir, if you're sitting right there and I went ping, got it, I could communicate the same thing to you if you were over there and say, here's what I found over here, as a visual picture. Um, the reason why I put this on, there's something called um, a publication hold, where you found something amazing, you've made a presentation, um, but you don't feel that you have enough data in order to really publish it. And this is vital, vital if you're going to do something that's peer reviewed. Um, so, the animal needs to be a carnivore. Since echolocation is generated for finding objects that are obscure, or sight is not an option. 
Because the generation of echolocation is costly, physically, extremely costly, there needs to be a survival mechanism driving the animal to create it. In the case of dolphins or whales, this means food or navigation. It was determined that the animal in Lake Champlain generates the same frequencies and has virtually the same signatures as beluga whale and killer whale, and an amalgam of both, essentially. And additionally, by using an array of hydrophones, it was determined that the animal swims at approximately five knots and is about 15 foot long. Where did the uh, hydrophone go? Here's what we did, thank you. Um, it's something called vector sensors, which is classified um, by the United States Navy. And what it is basically is around here, there's X, Y, and Z axes. And it's anchored, not to the bottom of the lake, but it's anchored so it's st stable. And if you put a bunch of them in a really big circle or a square or a triangle, it doesn't matter how, and you access them all, which is a lot of programming, you can not only find out how fast something is going, you can find out how big it is. Computationally, it's extremely advanced, and we had to develop a whole new program in order to do it, but we based it off of my partner, Joseph Gregory, um, was advanced in test and measurement professor at NC State. And he actually designed the vector sensors that are on the front of a Ulysses-class submarine. There's 40 of them on it. 40 of them that are about twice this size. My vector sensor is about this big. And there's 40 of them in an array, in a big circle, in the front of a submarine. Because there are no dolphin or whale found in Lake Champlain, this finding is extreme interest to both marine biologists and acousticians. Chazzy Reef, an island in Lake Champlain, is the oldest reef containing coral in the world. Over 20 beluga whale skeletons, the oldest being over 14,000 years old, have been found in and around the Lake Champlain Basin, both on the Vermont and the Ark sides. The Champlain Sea is ancient and holds many mysteries, including fossils of underwater species found nowhere else in the world. We barely scratched the surface of, of what this area used to be. On June 23rd, we boarded Randy for Kess, beautiful 50-foot cruiser named Casablanca. Oh, sorry, I think I've got more pictures. Crew consisted of me, Joe, the guy on the right, right here, his wife, Marilyn Edwards, and that's Randy, the owner of the boat, and that's Mr. Al Martin, the former owner of Point Bay Marina. We actually weighed it when we got home, and it was 750 pounds of equipment, including a portable spectrum analyzer, which is this guy right here, three computers with digital signal, digital signal processing software, and data logging, 500 kbs sample rate, which basically this means is I can listen up to something that goes to 250,000 hertz. I can analyze it. It's half of what your logging, data logging is. Two Wilcox and amplifiers. Uh, that's these little guys right here. Please be careful. Um, three hydrophones, ESR, blah, blah, blah. Three reciprocal transducers. That's what I was telling you, the array we were doing. Two dot recorders, two digital video cameras, a GPS computer, and oh yeah, lots of patience and redundancy. We even had a real, real Nagra, which, I mean, if nothing else, it'll get it on there. Um, this is actually just left over from the main lecture that I gave. That's just the test and measurement device of the vector sensor. Um, we plotted the, the sightings on here. And this is an old map. We're making a new one now because this is 2003. But basically, when you look at this map, the little red dots are where Champ has been seen. Like I say, I'm fondly calling him Champ for a lack of any other name. Um, you can't call him, I guess we could call him Larry if you wanted to. But, um, so we found this. And what was interesting on this is, um, 
They seem to congregate where there's salmon and or smelt, which is since the salmon population has gone down, smelt is the other animal that has the highest fat content as far as food goes. So there's a place for you, Matt. We basically took 12-hour shifts um, listening to fish swim and water sounds have a tendency to push you to sleep. Um, and we, uh, we plotted the different schools of food, salmon, perch, and we could see the schools just by listening. Um, and then we played games with each other. <laughs> And then we nap. <laughs> a lot of the time we nap. Um, but on the second day of study at 8.45 a.m. in Button Bay, in 24 feet of water, we picked up a unique signal. It sounded exactly like dolphin or beluga whale echolocation, but we were on a lake. Can you run that short film? Thank you, dear. This is us finding it, and uh, I'll explain it as we go. And Ginger is why just happened to have the video camera on, because the, the TV crew from Discovery Channel wasn't. I might want to turn it up. Okay, that's when Joe said there's something going on, and I started recording data logging which comes off this guy directly into the computer, which you can sort of see on the left. This top guy right here is showing us where the relationship to the array of this creature is, which means they're within the array. Whatever's making the signal is within the array. And then Ginger, we're talking amateur video here,
representation of the sun called an FFP. Here's your frequency. Here's only to where we can hear. So what you just heard, we can only hear to hear. Everything else in the major loud portions of the signal go off all the way past 100,000 hertz, which means it's echolocation. All right, this is the other. This is a 2D FFT. I stopped as we were data logging because we got this three times at three different locations. At one point, I just said, okay, I'm just going to slam this and drop it down. And what this is, is this is 45,000 hertz. And I knew I had to do this off the DAT recorder because most people don't have the system we have. They can't go up that high. And they also didn't have the equipment from the Navy that we have. And so I try to do it to compare with what other researchers have done with dolphin echolocation um, and whale echolocation. This is 45,000 hertz. We can only hear to hear. Everything above this line, we can't hear. This is the time domain, so it's uh, 1.61 seconds. Um, and the loudness, or how loud it is, is the dark red. This right here is nothing. Now, check this out. The top one is the one we got off Lake Champlain. This is why I did this. The bottom one is Rizzo's Dolphin. Now, if you notice something, one, two, three. One, two, three. They're sexually similar. The time domain is mm, close. And see, where you see this, the high pitch, really fast clicking, is this. But this is exceptionally distinct, and it's in every echolocation. The things that are abnormal and that are different compared to dolphin and killer whale and beluga whale is this one. This one is so incredibly regular, and there seems to be an optimal, optimal frequency that they use, which is right around, it's about 33,000 or 33, 33, hertz. Uh, top one, or bottom one, and then the top one's about 35,000 hertz. So it's very odd that it's like that. Um, Although, when you look at dolphins, they have a tendency to do the same thing. But this is, it's really, it's very unique. That's what has a lot of acoustician stuff about it. All right, this is where it gets fun. This is the Lake Champlain sound, followed by silence, then Rizzo's dolphin echolocation. This is so you can hear what they, how similar they, they sound. frequency range. This is only like a thousand, twelve hundred hertz, and then it starts sounding above that. You can see, well see why I fell asleep. Okay, and then they said, it's got to be a fish finder. Oh, my she was a fish finder, y'all. That's what she got. <laughs> That's what a fish found is. Fish finder and sonar sounds like. So, no, none of those. 
The St. Lawrence Seaway currently has a small population of beluga whale, well, recently studied by a good friend of mine, Pete, who has like 1,600 degrees, who is an assistant professor of animal biophysics, blah, 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 communication science department at the University of Connecticut. He is intrigued by the echolocation panel in Champlain, as it may be connected with an ancient and now cut off population of beluga whale that have evolved after being separated from the St. Lawrence Seaway. If this is the case, this population of unique animals have developed over the years into a species entirely unique to science. In fact, he put out an abstract and that also put on the lay a study because he's, he's actually taking DNA samples right now from the beluga whale up there. And I'm uh, really interested in another theory is that the animal in Lake Champlain is even older than a whale, a living fossil, so to speak, a theory which has caused serious debate in the biology, paleontology, and zoology world. Believe it or not, behind the scenes of the, oh, it's champ, and the videotapes of some guy that's been having been a little you know, I mean, behind the scenes, there are actually a bunch of us biologists and zoologists that are really serious about this. Um, in this case, the animal would have evolved alongside beluga whale, but it be entirely unrelated, adapting itself to the cold, dark, and deep depths of Lake Champlain. Because this animal almost assuredly is a carnivore, hence the echolocation, why would they bother? It would not only have to be mammalian, but perhaps reptilian as well, combining the attributes. For some part of the year, this creature would most likely have to essentially hibernate and would be either live-bearing, an egg layer, or a unique type of monitoring. Um, an example of a monitoring is the uh, duckbill platypus. And, I mean, we're even banding around the theory that it can switch to female and male at will, but we started to discover some more things on our new journey with this. Okay, the signal obtained from Lake Champlain goes up to 140 kilohertz, seven times above our hearing range, within the range of echolocation or biosonar, which only dolphins, whales, bats, and two types of birds are capable of producing. The producer of the signal was swimming at the time it was creating the signal. The signal could not have been produced by a human underwater. The signal sounds like an under-analysis closely resembles that of killer whale, beluga whale, and or dolphin. To our knowledge, there are no whales or dolphins in Lake Champlain. If they are, they're social. Whales and dolphins are social. They will come up to the boat. You would see them. The signal is captured four times, three times at three different locations by us, and a fourth time by another acoustician in August not affiliated with us. We did that on purpose. We paid them to go up and go to sea. Um, and these are three different, the, the ones we got were three different animals. My voice is certainly different from this young lady's here. Everybody's voice is different. That's kind of what makes the cat purse study really interesting because their purse are all the same. But there's a big difference. So you can tell not only how fast it's going, how big it is, by just passively listening. And you can also tell if it's the same creature, if it's a different one. What we know it's not. Here's some of the ones that have been hilarious. Beaver, wow, gosh, that's a really big beaver, A. B, beaver don't echolocate. Otter, once again, I would really not want to meet up with that otter in the dark. And otter don't echolocate. Deer or moose, um, as far as I know, they don't go underwater a whole lot unless they're drowning. And they don't echolocate either. Sturgeon or any other fish, fish do not echolocate. Definitely not a turtle. They don't echolocate, and that's a gigantic turtle. Once again, like the beaver or otter, I wouldn't want to meet it. Zebra mussel, geez, uh, that would be a no. Um, Man-made signal, we covered that with the sonar. Um, to be honest with you, this is still an ongoing real struggle in the Navy um, because Today, they still have not been able to even come close to mimicking true bias on other whales and dolphins do. Common misperceptions. <laughs> this is my favorite. It's the sound of a fisherman's reel. Okay, remember when we were talking about hertz, one cycle per second? Now, 100 hertz, that would mean you have to 
be doing that 100 times. 100,000 cycles per second? <laughs> Okay, this is impossible. Is this sturgeon? No. No fish echo, okay. There's not enough in a lake to sustain a breeding population. Okay, I'm sorry. How do you know that? When you don't even know where the animal is. It was a hoax. Impossible. Size scan sonar hasn't found it. We're going to get to that in a minute. It's a fish finder. We've already covered that. The pinging. Okay. This is important because then we go, well, side scan sonar hasn't found it yet. A side scan sonar is a fan-shaped beam which is narrow in the horizontal dimension along the boat's direction of travel, say one degree, and wide in the vertical. For this example, we say 30 degrees. It is also very short in transmit time so that its length is only a very tiny fraction of the given range setting. This sonar beam is transmitted to one side of the boat. The sonar beam emerges from the transducer, which means what's sending the signal out, has a brief transmit pulse. Very shortly after this trans transmit pulse, the sonar electronics switch over to receiving. As the sonar pulse travels along the sea bed at approximately 4,800 feet per second, any objects that are encountered will reflect some sort of the sound back towards the receiver. The receiver side is plotting the return echoes, or lack thereof, as a function of time in relation to the original transmit pulse. The signal strength is also plotted. If you have an image window of 500 by 500 pixels, typically this one transmit pulse will represent one line of the image or one pixel high by 500 pixels long. Each successive pulse will in turn produce another line of image data. As the boat moves forward, each successive line is stacked alongside the one before. So that after 500 transmits pulse or pings, you will have one complete image or picture. If you are generating 10 pings per second, ping, 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 uh, you will have one complete image or picture. If you are generating 10 pings per second, it will take 50 seconds to produce one full image. As the ranges get longer, the echoes take longer to return and can sometimes take several minutes to make up one full image. In fact, the stuff that you see that was done by Middlebury College, <laughs> they're doing long range. They're almost essentially stationary. Typically, this image will scroll on the screen as each successive line is painted and old image data is replaced with new. All of this takes time and works well with objects in the water which are stationary. If an object is moving significantly in relation to the seabed, there can be large amounts of distortion in the resulting image. And they're coming out and trying their desperation to track schools of fish in um, the ocean. And um, Scripps Oceanography is doing the best they can. All you see of a school of fish is a big blob. Okay? And the friend of mine that wrote this is head of the size scan sonar division at S. Scripps in California. And I said, well, how would you get a picture of it using size scan sonar? And he says, well, I guess you could probably tie champ to a buoy. So this business of size scan sonar is it's ridiculous. That's what you, it looks like. And this is, this is from the name. This is what it looks like as it's, it's what it does. And if there's a, you know, something going on here. Well, first of all, it's going to hear it because the, the signals are coming out in largely the same range. So it's sort of like deer hunting with a boom box. Um, and then it's just going to show up as a massive blur. It's going to look like a school of fish. All right, this is our new study. Um, this is Mike Frizzell. Um, he's a lab coordinator and a senior scientist at the University of Maryland's Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology Division. We call him the troubleshooter. Uh, he always tells us to look out, be careful, don't do that. And then there's me. Hey, I just recorded that darn. That's going to leave a bruise because they didn't listen to Mike. And then Will off to my left, a senior optics engineer from North of Roman, specializing in infrared and heat seeking technology. Here, hold my battery. I want to go see what it is. That's when we end up getting bruises and like, oh, I told you so. <laughs> Although successful in obtaining a few signals using manned means, it would be of greater scientific value to record continuously at several different locations for the maximum amount of time possible. 
during the spring, summer, and fall. This will require the use of an autonomous recording unit. I think you have probably seen stuff in National Geographic about the ocean sensors that are called pop-ups. They, they record something, then they pop up, and they transmit. That's essentially what we're going to be doing. Um, this is kind of sort of, as we go along and we're investigating a lake and getting this and trying to put this together, this is all going to change. But essentially, we've got an infrared security camera, an onshore analog, uh, analog tape backup, custom power supply, uh, a week's storage, a week's worth of signal storage, and essentially what it's going to do is going to trigger a 360-degree view of infrared and uh, ultraviolet. The custom bill, um, each autonomous unit will be prepared to record continuously for one week without having to uplink. As well, each unit will be designed to record continuously for 48 hours and have staggered uplinks on specific days of the week. In other words, it's going to pop up and send a signal satellite, and then we get it wherever we are. In case of uplink failure, the backup analog tape function on the shore will be triggered and be capable of recording for 48 hours continuously before human attention is needed. It is indeed sad that the biological sciences have not taken more interest in this freshwater biosonar. Apparently, even though our science and the observations of those people that have researched this creature for years are excellent, and the findings of ours they're physically irrefutable because it's math. People still do not believe that a creature either new to science or previously undetected can possibly live in a freshwater lake. I will leave you with this, however. In 1998, the first picture of a job in rhino was taken. Although the animal had been described by natives for the last several centuries, it wasn't until the 1930s that biologists took notice and only recently was co actually confirmed by photographs. 1998. <laughs> in 2006, biologist Stephen Wolfrat, a scientist with the World Wildlife Fund, discovered an entirely new species in the jungles of Borneo, which again had been described by natives but unknown to scientists until now. This animal is a cross between a civet and a lemur, having the characteristics of both its animals this big. Um, having a care of, and was photographed using photographic traps which are triggered when something crosses a beam of light set across the path. This is also how the rhino was photographed. Basically, well, my whole point is if you cannot find a 4,000 pound land mammal in a forest, how are you going to find a 15 foot long elusive creature in a dark, deep, murky lake? Basically, the here, and here's a really important point. I'm almost on the lecture, but people are getting antsy. Um, but our climate is changing, and you really need to start going to ge geological websites and read the journal articles that are online, because the media isn't telling you. The media is telling you political stuff like global warming. Well, they, if you notice, they started, they're starting to call it global change. Um, there's a reason why, because there's a whole bunch of scientists that are screaming like, it's not necessarily global warming. We could turn in, this could be, we could be another ice age for all we know. Basically, when climates change, the species are trying to follow the climate they are adapted for. So they move around the landscape to stay in the same climate space. When they do that, populations get left behind in the case of the lake. These populations might get isolated, not just for morphological, that is physical, or genetic changes. You might get a species or population trapped in a place where climate is changing, which would induce a selective force to make them change or go extinct. Changeovers from one set of species to another occur regularly, and new species are discovered every day. We simply do not even have a clear understanding of the fossil record. That is from the Director of Paleontology at the Smithsonian. That's a direct quote. Can anybody tell me where the spider is on here? On the top photo? This photo? Where's the spider? Do you think it's where the arrow is? No. Very, very top of each one. But what it's done is spun a likeness, likeness of itself so that if a bird comes along, 
It's going to eat that part and not its egg or itself. This is Cave Island. Why is it called Cave Island? It's in Lake Champlain. Everybody says, oh, there's no limestone. There's no caves underneath ground. Actually, most of this entire basin was made of karst, which is limestone. So the argument, well, where would it go? Where would it hide? Is anywhere. Um, can anybody tell me the difference? This is the same species of plant, technically, same family. Um, can anyone tell me the difference of what it's doing between the two? Okay, I'll give you a hint. I can tell you. What? Um, the plant on the left is mimicking the disease that would be on the right. The, you guys reversed, but you're exactly right. Yeah. What this plant, this plant is the one that's diseased, is right. eaten by worms. This one is mimicking it so that it doesn't get eaten because the animals will leave it alone. Can anyone tell me where this is? Black River. Hmm? Well, one's Otter Creek and the other one's another creek. Um, but what does it look like to you? To me, it looks like a primordial swamp. And this biomass right here, this, all this algae, is the reason why most of these places don't fully ice over. There's so much energy for the otters, for the t turtles, and for burying themselves that it's a protective structure. Now, when naturalists have gone in and witnessed this creature coming in and out, it usually comes in and out of these swamp areas. Why? Because what a perfect place to hide. And I was in the water or in a place like this at 5.30 in the morning. And it's amazing what's actually in these places. And the sad thing is there are several groups that are going, well, there's some invasive species coming, coming in there of like these lilies. And they're like, so they're trying to pull them out. I'm like, they're never going to get the whole root. They're just going to come back, A, B, if the planet is changing, there might be a reason why it's coming in there. And if it's going to get colder, it's going to protect the creatures. If it's going to get warmer, it's also going to protect the creatures, and it's going to keep the oxygen stable. In my opinion, don't mess with nature. Um, the one point that most every decent scientist involved in the enigma of the Lake Champlain animal concurs on this. We know very little about our planet, and if one can't get photographic evidence of 4,000 pound rhino on land until eight years ago, how is one supposed to find a large creature in a deep, dark, windy lake? One cannot use sonar as commercial sonars in the same frequency band as dolphin wildness creatures at the location. Using sonar would be sort of like deer hunting with a boombox playing loud rock music. Can you imagine going, hey, Bubba, you've got the shotgun. Hey, Bubba, look, losers, are easy. easy. I mean, it's just not going to work. Passive means include listening and using advanced optics, having determined the only way to photograph this animal. The goal of this research is to non-invasively, key point, document this animal for its own protection and that of the lake's ecosystem. I know that it's protected by Vermont and New York State, but to be honest with you, if it's not identified, you cannot get endangered species protection from the United States government. Uh, if it's identified, we can have that, and there'll be no pollution in this lake. Okay. Um, by the way, on any sort of investigation, you have to have Scooby Snacks. Very, very important. Um, so that's, we're, we're doing the site survey right now, and this is a three-year project. We have funding for three of those years, but basically we're throwing a whole bunch of money <laughs> into this ourselves and we're running out. So we're trying to find as many donors and volunteers as possible. Um, this was the research crew from um, 2003. I love that photo. Um, and these were some of the people that donated to us on the last. Um, study. And there's my buddy Joe. And that's it. Are there any questions?
Does it seem unusual to you that nobody found a body or something? No, not at all. That it would just sink to the bottom? Absolutely. And I mean, if you've, if you've ever dove in a way she played in most places, I mean, <laughs> months up to here, just, you know. Um, and if it's any sort of creature, um, and if it does float up, uh, in fact, there have been, there have been tales of people hitting something, and they thought it was a carcass, but when they go back to find it, they've hit it, they run over it with a boat, and it's sort of sunk. Um, I have an idea that they do sort of a similar thing as whales do, and that um, beluga whales do it too, mm -hmm. and, and, and cats. They'll go off and just bury themselves, and, and literally, you know, just stop. Um, it's not a surprise to me, it's very, very rare that you ever see even a, a blue whale carcass, even if they're very close to shore. That it, it'll show up as some blubber or like fin or something. It's, nah, it's not a surprise to me at all. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So just to recap, with your research, you were able to um, hear sounds that fish don't normally make, um, that usually, typically, um, animals that are carnivorous make, and uh, uh, the bioacoustic sound. And then um, you discovered three different um, signal sources. Exactly. In other words, what, there were three animals that create three different animals that created echolocation. Three different animals, um, and I mean the echolocation was is, is essentially the same. In other words, it's not beluga whale, it's not dolphin, it's not killer whale. It's like an amalgam of all of them. We can't identify it, but they're different individuals because my voice is different than yours. Um, and really, they're. <laughs> I don't know what's out there. I just know that uh, I know that it's not the native species. I remember, if you remember last time I recorded everybody right. in here, right. it's, it's not. And I mean, we recorded so many fish there, and we recorded sturgeon. I mean, we saw a whole school of sturgeon. None of, nobody's echolocating, and there's no papers out there. There's, I mean, we went through all of the journal articles. There's no papers out there that ever has indicated that a fish echolocates. Um, even in marine environments, the ocean, tortoises don't do it. Pinnipeds may do it. Seals, they certainly go high frequency, but they don't echolocate, which would really super high frequency. They, just, they, they communicate in high frequency range, but they're not here, which is meaning that you're actually seeing sound. It's called perfect underwater sight. Um, a pinniped seal. Um, and walrus. Um, so, really, it's, it's, it's none of us here don't do it either. So, and, and I have one other question. Sorry, folks, I have lots of questions. <laughs> but um, is is it true that a, a rizzo would have the same sound no matter whether it's differences in in, in animals, or would they have? Um, Similar or different sounds? Oh, no, each dolphin is completely different. Is it? Okay. Oh, yeah, each the beluga whale, beluga whale, dolphin, all the whales. You know, say you have six um, right whales. Each one is easily identifiable by their own personal signature. Okay, so the cat is an anomaly. Yeah. The cat and the tiger. Well, the, yeah, that's why they said it's just a fur and they're all the same. That's a completely unheard of. Right. Okay. Um, so are you saying that it's passive? Oh, yes. Are they fine? It has to be passive. You can't use sonar because the animal's going to hear that. It's in the same frequency range that, you're, the, the, that they communicate in, so they're not going to do it. You want to find it that way. And you're going to fight it with size scan sonar. It's going to show up like a big block. And you're also going to have to have <laughs> very advanced equipment. Um, did I get back everything? No, I didn't. So any other questions that you have? Or? Yeah, sorry. Give Elizabeth another round of applause.